Welcome to The Wallet by Prey Stevens, the show that talks Ugandan real estate investing, business and finance. And I'm your host, Stephen Oriem. Buying land and property has always been a dream for Ugandans living in the diaspora. That's why we hear so many stories of people either getting ripped off, scammed, but ultimately losing money. So how can you buy land in Uganda? After living in Uganda for three years, I've been able to successfully purchase land. And this is why I've created my ultimate guide on purchasing land in Uganda. I've broken my guide down into seven easy to follow steps. Step one, understanding the Ugandan land ownership rules. Step two, searching for land and industry professionals to help you complete a site visit. Three, authenticating the land ownership. Four, negotiations, assurances, and protection. Five, surveying and securing your land. Six, the process of registering your title with the supporting documents. Seven, the costs associated with purchasing and titling your land. Step one, understanding the Ugandan land ownership laws. Before buying land in Uganda, it's important to fully understand the laws that govern the land ownership. Presently in Uganda, there are four types of land tenure systems, customary, milo, freehold, and leasehold. The customary land tenure system is used to govern land ownership for indigenous communities. The laws are in line with indigenous customs and norms, stating that land can be owned by an individual, a family, or a community. This type of ownership is the most widely adopted in Uganda, mainly because rural areas govern land ownership in this way. However, there are limitations with this type of land governance. For example, proper records are not kept, making it difficult to purchase or resolve land-related conflicts. The Milo land tenure system governs land ownership for land registered before and up to 1928. The registration comes with a plot number, title and deed. This type of ownership states that land is owned in perpetuity, meaning forever, and is predominantly found within Bagandan regions like Kampala. Currently, there are over 250,000 Milo titles in existence, and they were all issued before 1928. Today, you can only purchase Milo land in two ways, either from subdividing an existing title or by transferring a title between an old and a new owner. The freehold land tenure system is very similar to the Milo in the sense that the land is registered and owned in perpetuity. However, the main difference is new freehold titles can be issued. It's possible to transfer a customary and a leasehold into a freehold land title. But this is subject to articles 2372C of the Constitutional Land Act of 1998 that states only Ugandan citizens are eligible to own land under all four land tenure systems. What this means is foreigners or non-Ugandans are only eligible to own land under the leasehold tenure system. However, the law also states that companies owned by foreigners or non-Ugandans is eligible to own Milo or freehold land, but this is only if a Ugandan citizen is a majority shareholder with 51% of non-transferable shares. The leasehold tenure system governs ownership for land registered for a particular period of time, usually between 49 to 99 years. The title comes with a plot, block number and deed. Any landowner in Uganda, whether customary, milo or freehold, may lease their ownership to another individual or a company. The leasehold agreement will grant exclusive possession rights for an agreed period of time, usually in exchange for a rental fee. Step 2 searching for land and industry professionals to help you complete a site visit. When searching for land, I recommend using an estate agent. Advise the estate agent on exactly what you're interested in purchasing, the size, location, and the tenure system. I recommend you look for titled land, either milo, freehold, or leasehold. This is important because these are the only types of ownership where proper records are kept. Appoint a lawyer. Make sure it's one that specializes in real estate acquisitions. Personally, I use a company called ALP East African Advocates. They specialize in real estate acquisitions in Uganda, Kenya, and South Sudan. They have a highly competent and professional team. If you'd like to know more about ALP or you're seeking a qualified service provider, head over to praystevens.com. Our experience in the market has allowed us to network with amazing people from real estate agents, lawyers, and building contractors who are all looking forward to helping you achieve your real estate goals. Next thing to do is arrange a site visit to view the location, understand more about the neighborhood, social infrastructure, road links and landmarks. Your real estate agent and lawyer should help you contact the local leadership, the LC1 in the area. 
It's so important to speak to the LC1 and the neighbours to understand the proper history, gain insight and learn about the ownership of the land. This information is important to discover hidden truths like squatters claims and ongoing disputes. Step 3. Authenticate ownership of the land. Once you're happy and ready to move forward, request a photocopy of the seller's land title. This will help you authenticate the owner's details. Your lawyer can then perform a land search at the land office to verify the authenticity of the land title and the ownership. A land title search usually takes about three days to produce and will confirm the full details of the property and the ownership. Step four, negotiations, assurances, and protection. To bridge any language barrier between you and the seller, I advise letting your estate agent negotiate on your behalf. Have a budget in mind. Tell your real estate agent what you're willing to pay and then make an offer. If your offer is accepted, ask your lawyer to draft a sample sales agreement and add the following points. Include the full property details, size, location, landmarks, and any information that clearly identifies the property. Also add a payment schedule. Depending on your situation, you could pay over a number of months or over a year. But assuming you have all the cash ready, I recommend paying 20% deposit at first then completing the payment once the title has been transferred into your name. The seller should use the 20% deposit to cover any outstanding land rates or any pending fees that could impact the sale of the land. Also add a clause that states, once you've made that deposit, you should be given full access to the property. This will be very helpful when it comes to surveying and securing the property. On a side note, at this point, the sales agreement will not be signed, nor will you make any payment to the seller until step six. Step 5. Surveying and securing your land. Hire a registered surveyor. A good firm I can recommend is uh, one that's called Riverstone Property Services. So what they'll do is they'll verify the size of the land, open the boundaries and identify mark stones on the land. The next thing to do is to schedule the date for the survey to take place. At the same time, you'd also need to schedule a broadcast in the local paper and the radio station to run a week prior to the survey informing the local community that a sale of land is taking place. This is important because the neighbours and the LC1 will attend, so if there's any hidden issues with the land, this will give people an opportunity and a chance to object to the sale of the property. Once the surveyor has completed the survey, he will then issue you with a survey report. The next thing to think about after the survey is securing your land. On the day of the survey, I recommend you invite a security company to provide you with a quotation to fence the land if it's not already been fenced. I strongly recommend a company called Secondolia Systems Limited. They are the leading providers of security products in Uganda. Step 6. The process of registering your land title with supporting documents. Now you have your survey report, you need to share that with your lawyer. Your lawyer can prepare a final sales agreement which will include the actual size, land boundaries and mark stones of the land. Now both you and the seller can then sign their sales agreement. And at this point, you can make the 20% deposit to the seller as per the sales agreement. The seller's lawyer will need to produce a transfer and a consent to transfer document issued by the commissioner of lands for both parties to sign. Then you'll need a valuation report. Your lawyer will make an application for a valuation at your cost to the government valuer, who will then make a side visit to enable the preparation of the valuation report that will be used to assess the stamp duty. The land office uses the stamp duty as a registration fee and the valuation report to determine the true open market value on the date of transfer. Next document is the payment of stamp duty. You're obligated to pay the stamp duty, which is a tax levy on transactions for registration and transfers. The land office will then issue you a receipt of payment and then start the process of registration and transfer. The seller's lawyer will provide you with the original title deed, a copy of the signed and witnessed transfer documents, receipts of paid up land rates, plus clearance certificates, and the consent to transfer. Once you've received all the documents, you will then make the final payment to the seller. Step seven, the costs associated with purchasing and titling the land. Legal fees should be around one to 2% of the property value. The stamp duty, usually 1.5% of the property value. Registration fees are around 0.05% of the property value. Registration fees include registration fees, bank fees, search fees, consent fees, and other related costs. And then you've got real estate agent fees, 
which are around about 5-10% to 10 of the property value. Thank you for staying to the end, we really appreciate you guys. If you'd like to see more content like this, please subscribe and leave your suggestions in the comment section. Stay safe, until next time.